The new ARC90 chassis by DeepCool is a case and CPU cooling solution in one, featuring an integrated Captain Series liquid cooling system with a 280mm radiator and two RGB fans that's tied to a distinct external flow indicator. Combine this with high-end features like tempered glass side panels, EATX support, and tasteful RGB lighting, and the new ARC90 could house your next epic PC build. Click the sponsor link in the description to learn more. Hey guys, how's it going? And welcome to Probing Paul episode number 24. We've made it to two dozen. This is my monthly Q&A video. There's really not too much to say beyond that. It's pretty straightforward. You guys ask me questions, I answer them. I do this every month, so check the playlist if you want to see prior questions asked in prior months. And I will do my best to make a bit of time stampery to go down in the comment section below, so check that out if you want to jump to a specific question. Let's get right into it though with my first question from Totally Not Paul. It says, hey Paul, you're looking a bit unkempt. How about a haircut and a shave? Also, any thoughts on planned product obsolescence? Very good question, Paul, very timely. Glad you asked this question right now because I do make videos to put on the internet, on YouTube, and uh, sometimes other places too. And I do typically take a glance in the mirror before I jump on camera, and I usually try to make sure I've shaved or given myself a haircut. Um, but I don't shave all the way. I don't actually have a razor or anything like that. I use just a beard and mustache trimmer, and every two, three days I just kind of trim it all up down there. That's why you probably have never seen me actually clean shaven. Cause I don't think I've been clean shaven since probably my wedding. But um, short story here, this is my beard and mustache trimmer. It's a Braun BT5050 and this has just died or at least become unusable, which sucks. Cause I had the previous model before this and it lasted me like four years. And this one is now like, it's they're usually self sharpening but the blades have gotten really dull and the battery is just pretty much kick the bucket after about a year. So that sucks. I hate it when products that used to be good now become crappy with a new version. And what manufacturer in their right man would, mind would be like, hey boss, I have a great idea. Let's make our product crappier. That'll give people a great opinion of it in the future. So uh, not going with Braun anymore for beard and mustache trimmers. Let's move on though. The remainder of the questions were taken from the comment section of last month's Probing Paul video. First one here from Nico. It says, Paul, would you buy a miner used card? Uh, basically a mining GPU, a graphics card that some cryptocurrency miner has taken and used for months or maybe a couple years in a crypto mining setting and now they want to sell it because they've gotten all their money out of it and now crypto mining is harder and so they want to make some money back. Is that card still worth buying? There's a few factors to consider here and there's really no direct yes or no answer. If the price is right, I guess would be the best answer I could give you. And hopefully prices will keep coming down as they have in the past month or two for graphics cards, not just new ones, but also used ones. And if crypto mining does become really ineffective on graphics cards, we might see a flood of used graphics cards on the market. So if you're looking at like half of what MSRP originally was for something like a used mining graphics card, then I would say go for it because your investment, your risk is significantly less. But there are three factors I would consider when uh, buying a used card and bear in mind you're buying a card on a used market so you're gonna have to trust whoever's selling it to you to be honest with how they used it and everything. So number one, was it overclocked? If it was overclocked, especially if additional voltage was applied for an extended period of time, I would not buy that card, simply because overclocking, especially with additional voltage, is the best way to basically run out a CPU or GPU's lifespan and make it die much faster. Number two would be a question about the other power delivery components on the board. Depending on the board's quality and the quality of the components used, uh, certain products are more, pr more prone to failing more quickly than others. Capacitors, the little cylindrical shaped things, are what often you'll see bulge and eventually pop and die. Now, a good graphics card will use nicer capacitors that have a much longer lifespan, but it's something that I would visually look at on the card, check the caps indefinitely, and make sure none of them are bulging before you buy it if you have that opportunity. The third thing would be to test out the cooling solution, basically the fans. Um, if the fans have been running for a very long time, non-stop, and the card has been working the whole time, then the fan life might have degraded. Now, fans are a little bit more viable as far as being able to like swap out fans and maybe get the card back up and running again. So there again, it would default back to how much are you paying for this card? But anytime you buy a used graphics card or any used computer component, you are taking a risk. So balance that risk with the uh, price reduction that you're getting by buying a used component and also Reality check, double check how much you would be able to buy something for brand new and then make your judgment based on that. 
Next question here from Andrew Schweier, and I position this one as the next question because it's kind of a follow-up to the previous one. But uh, the question is, how much degradation does overclocking do to a component? Uh, this particular question is with regards to a friend of his who wants to overclock but isn't sure if they want to because they're worried about reducing the lifespan of their components. And that's a perfectly viable fear. And my advice to your friend here would be go ahead and give it a shot because uh, as long as you're not cranking up the voltage, you're not going to have much chance of actually damaging your components. With modern computer builds uh, and over CPU overclocking, the computer is going to shut itself off or basically fail to boot before it allows you to do anything that will actually damage that hardware, unless you're like, you know, wiring things up yourself or something like that. Once you've done some overclocking and then you kind of hit a wall with the clock speed you're able to hit, then the uh, idea comes to you like, oh, if I increase the voltage, then maybe I can increase the clock speed. And yes, you can. Now, this is why if I'm overclocking, I usually test out some higher overclocks and test out some increased voltage. And then eventually, if I'm looking for something long term, I adjust the voltage back down to what it ships at stock or maybe slightly above or even slightly below if you can get away with it. That's actually a really cool thing to do. And then find myself a clock speed that, you know, is higher than what it ships at, but still not crazy high to the point where I'm worried about it running really hot all the time, because those are the two things you want to avoid. Higher voltage over an extended period of time and higher heat over an extended period of, period of time. So this is another reason why it's actually a little bit easier to overclock in the winter versus the summer, because ambient temps might be a little bit lower, but hopefully uh, that feedback gives you a little bit better idea of what to do moving forward. But give overclocking a try. I waited way too long to start overclocking in my personal PC building career, and once I actually tried it, I realized it's not that difficult, and it's really hard to actually damage stuff unless you're really doing things strangely for some reason. So give it a shot, let me know how it goes. Next question is from Morrowheat23, and I actually responded to this question uh, last month, but I'm gonna respond to it here again. He says, why are some of your videos 1080p, some 1080p60, and some 4K? Is there any rhyme or reason to that? Now, there is. First off, I shouldn't be posting any videos that are just 1080 anymore. Um, my live stream should be 1080 and then beyond that, I go either 1080 or 4K. The decision for me is often based on the type of video. So recently I've been doing vlogs from time to time because it helps me get stuff done while also making a video. And for vlogging, I have been using uh, the RX100 Mark V from Sony. And I got this because it's got the flip up screen, great for vlogging, can do face tracking, uh, focusing, and all that kind of stuff. It's a cool little camera and it shoots 4K, but it overheats when shooting 4K. So you can only shoot clips that are a few minutes long. So I've gotten used to using this camera and then I've realized that it's more effective to use this camera if I need to shoot a lot of footage at 108060. So for that reason, 108060 is what I go for for this. 108060 is the capture method that I have set up for these videos, so that's what this video should be going at as well. And then beyond that, if I'm doing anything where I'm trying to get crisper, cleaner footage of like a case or a build or something like that, those I usually do 4K and I'm filming more more often with my GH4 or my GH5. Now the GH5, which I'm filming this with right now, can do anything up to 4K 60 FPS. So probably what I'm eventually gonna move everything to is 4K 60 frames per second. Next question is from Blakey23, and this kind of relates to the previous question. He's asking, if films display 24 frames per second, that's usually what films are recorded at, why does 30 frames per second in a game look awful? And he says he could easily Google this, but he'd rather hear it from me. Well, Blake, I Googled this, just, just to make sure I wasn't feeding you any bad information here. So the 24 frames per second thing basically goes back to the introductory of filmmaking, videography in general, and when they were developing film cameras that take took the photons going in and it exposed it on an emulsification layer on a uh, film that was in a camera that like, went by. You know how cameras work. Point being, they were trying to find a frame rate that was good enough that it would fool the eye into thinking there was video going on, but slow enough that it was cheaper because the more film you exposed, the more you had to develop and that was money. So they were trying to find the cheapest way to make film and 24 frames per second was what they decided on was okay. Now, interestingly enough, even though films were filmed at 24 fr frames per second back then, they were actually projected at 48 frames per second. They would do two exposures for each frame of the film. Now, bringing this back to modern times, you are probably noticing this if you play video games, because for me, the jump from 30 to 60 was most noticeable when going from a, a game to not a game. And a big reason here that you're noticing that more with something like a video game is the responsiveness. Like, if you're doing something like playing a game or even something as simple as moving a mouse cursor across a screen, it's updating either 30 times per second 
uh, if it's 30 hertz, or 60 times per second if it's 60 hertz or 60 frames per second. The smoothness is just so noticeable when you're actually taking something and physically moving it around the screen, or if you're playing a game where the responsiveness is important there. Smoothness is also important when you're, say, playing something like a first-person game with lots of movement going around, updating the edges of the screen, keeping it from looking choppy. That's a very important thing for something like playing a video game. And we compare that to something like film and cinematography even in the modern day, there is something, I think, of an aesthetic nostalgia for the way film originally was, 24 frames per second. So people refer to it as the cinematic look or something like that, which I can appreciate. And I definitely still appreciate just fine 24 frames per second in film work and stuff like that. And it really comes down to an aesthetic choice. Uh, also, there is something of a stigma with the higher frame rate stuff, like uh, The Hobbit was shot at 48 frames per second, I believe, and a lot of people got irritated with that because it gives you what's often referred to as, as the soap opera effect. Everything looks too sharp and too crisp, and it almost makes things look fake. Ultimately, though, I think it's just up to the individual to decide what they like better when it comes to viewing something like a movie, but definitely when it comes to games, higher frame rate is always better. 60 or above for me, and um, I'm getting to the point where 100 or above is even better. 144 hertz refresh rate monitors are super nice, and if you can afford one and you have a system that can power one, I highly recommend checking one out. Thank you for your question, though. Next question is from Peter KJ Richter. This is a very long question. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's up here if you guys want to read it. Thank you for your thanks at the ends to all of us who make tech channel videos and everything, but the question's here in the middle. He's basically talking about him and his friends upgrading PCs that may be a little bit older and how practical uh, a one or two generation old system is. Specifically here, a Z270 or H270 system with something like a sixth gen CPU. So Peter, my advice here would be double check the current prices of new stuff because there are benefits to getting new things. They're usually a little bit faster and usually a little bit more feature rich, but buying new gets you other benefits too, such as a warranty from a manufacturer so you can return a product and get it replaced if you need to. That said, uh, you're talking about buying computer parts the way I usually buy cars, which is I usually buy cars that are two to five years old that have already lost their depreciation value from driving off the lot, and I try to get a nice bang for the buck uh, balance between something that's relatively new, but maybe not new new, and something that will get the job done, and of course something that is uh, maybe a little bit easier on the wallet. So, yes, sixth gen CPUs are still totally viable. Even the newest stuff hasn't increased that much in performance. What you're really gonna be stuck with, though, is quad core. So that's your limiting factor when you're talking specifically about Z270 and H270. There are no six core CPUs available on that platform, so if you eventually down the line need more CPU processing horsepower, you're going to need to upgrade your entire system, or your friend's going to need to upgrade their entire system. Which is totally okay though. If the system was a bargain up front, then in a couple years you'll probably be in a position to upgrade it too. So yes, Peter, I think your friends will be satisfied with that option. Uh, just again, double check the current prices of new stuff before you go and spend money on used components. A couple more questions. These are less tech related, but first from Steve Sanders. Uh, Paul, are you more Dread Pirate Roberts or Adigo Montoya? Uh, this is assuming Kyle will be the other, and there may be a reason that I wore this shirt today, but I don't know if you asked this question because of this shirt or it's just perfect that your question provided me a great opportunity to plug my store. Guys, if you want to buy store uh, stuff, merch from me, uh, go to paulsarbright.net. It's linked in the video's description. And uh, this is an awesome hardware shirt, and I am Dread Pirate Roberts, and Kyle is Inigo Montoya. So Dread Pirate Roberts, that's what I go for. I actually dressed as a Dread Pirate Roberts, or the Man in Black, or Wesley uh, from Princess Bride for when I was in third grade for Halloween. Most of the people didn't know who I was, but I'm still a big fan of Princess Bride, and that's probably who I go with. Although Inigo Montoya does also have a pretty cool backstory, but um, I guess if forced to choose, I go with the, the Dread Pirate Roberts. Final question here is from Gonzo's Twin One, and he asks, Paul, do you use elevators or stairs? It's a good question. I originally thought this question was escalator or stairs, and it reminded me of my favorite Mitch Hedberg joke, which is uh, elevator, when the elevator breaks down, when the escalator breaks down, it just turns into stairs. Escalator has become stairs. Sorry for the convenience. I don't quite have the delivery that Mitch Hedberg does to, to say that joke properly, but it's a funny joke anyway. Uh, my, I have a two floor rule with elevators versus stairs. If I'm going up two floors, I take the stairs. Beyond that, elevator's okay. And I also apply this rule to other people who might be riding the elevator with me. Um, when I was in college, I lived in a 12-story building, and anytime anyone got on the elevator, we were up on the 11th floor, anytime anyone got in the elevator trying to go to the second or third floor, we'd just stink-eye them. 
the whole time, like, you lazy piece of garbage, use the stairs, you're taking time away from us getting upstairs to play more video games. But guys, that is pretty much all the time I have for Probing Paul for this month, so uh, check out my P.O. Box, or here is my P.O. Box, I guess I should say, so if you guys happen to want to send me anything, we usually do uh, mail time on the live show, which is every Tuesday evening at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time with me and Kyle, so uh, if you want to send stuff, please go ahead and do that. I also put that in the uh, description of every single video that I post. Uh, but until next time, thank you for watching Probing Paul. I'll be back with more tech videos, so don't forget to hit the thumbs up button and subscribe. Subscribe, of course, if you want to see more. Thanks again for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time.